The new book is all about innovation as a fuel for growth. That in the prior work that I've done, I've really looked at growth as a strategy problem. And I think we understand that now relatively well as to how do you think about market opportunities and how to seize those opportunities. The challenge is this. All companies are working in very fast-changing marketplaces. So you just look at the recession. Nobody predicted it was coming. Boom, it turned everybody's growth strategies upside down. So how do you create a dynamic, evolving, ever-adjusting approach to growth? And the answer, it turns out, is through innovation. That what firms need to do is innovate in two areas. One is innovate in how they go to market. The other is innovate in the quality and the capability of the offer that they put in the marketplace. And what we found is that the innovations that work are not the big grand slams and home runs. It's doing small things again and again and again that build upon each other to create really big transformative impact. So innovation is the fuel of growth, and that's what this book is all about. In innovation starts with focus. That if you innovate in a number of different dimensions a little bit, uh, you get a little bit better. But if you can innovate in a lane way and have all those innovations build upon each other and create a compounding effect, you can actually create a really big result. So small things can achieve large results, but it requires a concentration of focus. That's where you start. Second thing on innovation is nobody has a monopoly on good ideas. And in fact, the senior people that want to contribute their ideas the most often have the worst ideas because they're most disconnected from the marketplace. So you've got to use the voice of the customer, the voice of your frontline sales and service people that talk to those customers. That's one source of innovative ideas within a laneway for how we're going to grow. Second source is creative an analytics. So you look at root cause analysis, why are we where we are? Sometimes what falls out of is new ideas for how to improve. And thirdly, you can look at analogies in other industries, other companies, other organizations, say, what are they doing? How can we borrow on those ideas? So you get a whole surplus of ideas. They're just ideas for how we can grow within a particular laneway. Let's say the laneway is how we can increase share a wallet with a certain class of our clients. The next thing you need to do, though, now, is not bet on those innovations, because if you do invest in them at this point, it's just a bet. None of those things have been proven to work. You have to refine, test, improve, and importantly, test in the marketplace whether those ideas work in a very fast cycle. That's what de-risks the idea, separates the winners from the losers, and leaves you with a small set of pressure-tested ideas that you really know work. Then what you want to do is simply select the best of those for deployment and scaling. And what you've done in this process is you've taken something very risky, new ideas, and you've reduced it to something where the risk is manageable and you're willing to invest. Now the key to the whole thing is really this refinement and development process. How do you take what a sound on the surface like a lot of really good ideas and accept the fact that a lot of those ideas are going to have setbacks. A lot of those ideas are not going to work the way you thought because the devil's in the details. And what's key is to have a process in which you fall forward, you learn from it, and you evolve the idea to something else. For that to happen, there has to be a low commitment of resources to the idea, and things have to happen fast. Nobody minds failing if it's in a six or eight week cycle and it cost us a few thousand dollars. What people don't like failing on is something that took nine months and a million dollars, and now failure has real consequences. So fail quick, fail cheap, fail often, but fail forward can happen if the consequences of failure aren't that great. And that's, that's what's key to that step around developing and refining and testing your ideas. Yeah, if, if you look at the sources of new revenue growth, uh, it's a Mises-like framework, mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive. And it is clear that they, they require different skills and strategies and capabilities to succeed at one versus another. Um, the classic split is between hunters and farmers. So a farmer is someone who focuses on base retention or they focus on increasing share of wallet within an existing account. And the reason we think of them as farmers is because it takes a lot of relationship skills and it takes a lot of sensitivity to the as-is situation. You're not just bulldozing your way in. Whereas the people that are in new client acquisition or they're trying to reposition us in faster growing segments of the market, those are thought of as hunters. So oftentimes a company will in fact distinguish between roles and have different kinds of people going after different things. Um, in other cases it makes sense actually to put the stuff all together. I personally find that that's such a breadth of responsibilities that it's very hard for one person to do all of those things well to focus on all the source of revenue. And that's why selling increasingly is a team sport. You know, that there are very few individuals who manage a book of business. It's more typically a team of people trying to optimize the demand opportunity we can get out of a particular market. When I look at the meetings business, I've been around as a speaker for probably the better part of 30 years, so I've seen a lot of meetings. What I haven't seen is meetings change very much. I mean, it's a hotel, big stage, a lot of lighting, crew at the back, thousand people in the room, front to back conversation. I don't think they're very effective. They're very expensive, but I don't think they're very effective. And I think we've got to think about how to reconstruct meetings, not just in the world of the internet where you can actually bring new things to bear more quickly. I think the internet's having a small impact on meetings. 
I think the big issue is if we start with what's the result, the outcome we're trying to achieve from this meeting. Why are we bringing 150 of our leaders together in Florida for three days to have a conversation? And if we think about the outcome we're trying to achieve in terms of how people are thinking, talking, and doing things differently in the outcome, then we should work back to thinking about what are the interactions, what's the information transfer, what's the creative information creation that needs to take place before, during, or after the meeting to ultimately have an impact. And if you start with results and work back then to different ways that we can configure meetings, I think you can come out with things that are radically different than what we do today. We are simply going through the motion of doing what we always did in the past, and I think it's less and less effective than it's been in the past.